All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. First item on the council committee agenda is the livestock ordinance request. I'm gonna let Mr. Matthew Kramer take over. He has a presentation to go over with you guys. All right, I've uh, got it up here on the screen. We've already sent this out to council ahead of time. There is a request from the Kenton County Cons uh, Conservation District. They own a uh, small parcel of land next to Miles Elementary on Sunset. Uh, it's a little under an acre. Um, they are requesting to use goats to clear out the uh, brush as opposed to paying a group to come in and remove it mechanically. So. We initially told them that the ordinance uh, prohibits any livestock within 500 feet of any uh, property or any uh, residence as per our ordinance. So they still made the request. I told them I would at least bring it to council for council's review. Um, this is the, if you look, that's the lot that they're um, talking about. They would have um, temporary fix fencing, of course, to contain any goats if that's something that the council is interested in doing. Um, I haven't done a ton of, um, we haven't looked at the application and, and things like that yet because I wanted to see what council was really interested in. Um, it would go through the codes office since it's, a, it's part of their um, process, so they would be the approving or denying of the uh, applications is what I would uh, suggest. And you know, I just threw on here as a, as a recommended change um, that the same, the same verbiage as they have and just add unless a short-term permit is permitted by the city, no permit be approved for over three weeks and must contain a plan to monitor and contain the livestock introduced to the property. Uh, I'm sure Jack will have better legal terms than that, but that's what I threw together. Um, the, the only thing with this, just so everybody's aware, that would, that includes fowl and livestock, and those are the definitions of fowl, including uh, hens, roosters, chickens, ducks, livestock, or including uh, the horses, cattle, sheep, swine. Again, I don't know what other people would use for temporary livestock or fowl other than this idea of, of using it as a kind of a green way to clear land that's cheaper and I guess more natural, but I guess Theoretically, somebody could do any of the other ones. What's that? But, yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, I get with the way it, what we're looking at here, I could bring chickens into my yard back in Woodland Hills for three weeks as long as I. If it's approved by. Right. Because we're not, be we're not looking at it as just this one lot, right? We're looking Correct. at it as across the entire city. Right. It would, so. This would, if it benefits the entire city. That's why well, I got a lot of questions about this specific lot, and I really don't want to focus on that because we're talking about is this something we are interested in doing for the whole city? If yeah. it is, I'll do a little more detail. We'll have an application that there has to be a reason for it, not just you want to have them. You know, it would have to be pony rides in Lake Mont. Pony rides in Lake Mont for three weeks, right. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this council or the you know, prior councils have have talked this ad nauseum, you yeah. know, chickens and livestock and, and other things. It just I don't know. It seems like there's too many other other pieces that. Yeah, the only difference to this would be temporary. But again, if who's going to enforce it? It would be the codes officer, just like they do now. Yeah, they don't have enough to do. Yeah, run around yes. and look for damn Would goats. the temporary be three weeks? Is that the period? Again, I just made that up as a. I think that's what the Kenton County um, Conservatory said that they would need three weeks to have it cleared. So I just threw that. Again, we could make adjustments. At this point, I just I didn't want to put too much of an analysis on it if, if council wasn't interested at all. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm at. I'm against right now. it. Okay. I'm like, interested. I mean, it seems like they could just get, you know, get some volunteers and go clean some brush and call Correct. it a day. Get a lawnmower. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Vicki? Um, my concern is the abutting properties because I know that the uh, conservation the district did use the goats down at Goble Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are great escapee mm -hmm. artists, and they did get loose down there. And but there's no abutting residential homes. Whereas, if, you know, I am not familiar with the land, so I did the aerial view, right. and I could see like there's I think there's at least five homes. 
I would be worried about what they would think, you know, mm -hmm. no, that we're just coming in and saying, hey, you know, you're going to have these goats there for th three weeks. Uh, I personally wouldn't like it. And the other thing is, too, if council would want to go through this, that ordinance really needs to be tweaked. Mm -hmm. um, my suggestion would be governmental agency only. Um, and then, I don't know, the definition of livestock, it's kind of scary too. I mean, right. it's amazing. People will come up with things that we've never even thought of. That's, that's the only concern I have. I'm always on the cautious side. So right now I'm against it, but yep. I'm open if people really, you know. And, and the other thing is too, how much would it really cost? Do they have any cost estimate? I mean, it seems to me you get volunteers to get in there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they do have businesses that this is what they do. They bring out goats to uh, a property and, and use them to clear it. So, I mean, that's, it's used, I don't know if there's any local, but I, I, I've done, yeah, I've seen I've done a little too. research. Yeah, so yeah. so it, there's a business model out there for it. So obviously mm -hmm. there are customers and it's cheaper and easier and um, green and it doesn't require the complaints from have any equipment being used next to the neighbors too. So, I mean, I guess right. that's... Right, I, I think it'd be interesting to see what they think first right. before well, I would Yeah, and then you get the, that first complaint where there's, you know, the odor from the next door neighbor and that's affecting the use of their property. It just, you know, who, who's, who's wins there? Yeah. I personally think it's a great idea. However, across the whole city, I think we're opening a can of worms, guys. Anybody else before we move on? I didn't know we could have livestock any place in the city of Erlanger and why change it? We, you are allowed if it's within 500 feet of another property, which is pretty much nowhere in the city. So essentially they are banned from the city. I haven't been able to find any place just doing a quick search that you could have it within 500 feet, that it wouldn't be within 500 feet of another house. And that's what the current ordinance is. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on it. All right, if we can just do a quick straw poll of who would be interested in, in researching this more, just to give me some direction if we're gonna move forward. So if you could raise your hand if you're interested in me pursuing this, or we can tell them that we're not interested. One, two. All right, thank you. No good for you. <laughs> Matt, didn't you have an encounter with a goat over on uh, Earl Langer, over by the on off of Stevenson Road? Or yeah, maybe it was, it was on it was on Dixie. Dixie. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, I did. It was an easy pickup. They threw it in the back of a car, and they were gone. So, all right. Thank you, Matt. The next request we did have over this last month was from a business. Oops. Was from a business that was considering relocating into the city of Erlanger. Uh, one of their requests was to see if we would consider capping our occupational license fee to the F, uh, FICA maximum that's current. So the current maximum for that is 132,900. What that means is for our occupational license fee, it's one and a half percent of payroll. So that one and a half percent would only be charged up to $132,000 salary. And over that, there would be no one and a half percent. So just so everybody kind of understands what that does. There are a lot of other cities um, around us that do have some sort of a cap, whether it's the uh, FICA cap or other caps just for everybody's information. Um, you know, Dave and I were initially pretty interested in it. It's, it's something that would help us kind of set ourselves out even more. Uh, once we collected the data from Kenton County, uh, Kara did that for two weeks with Kenton County. Uh, we realized the impact was gonna be between 450 to 550,000. Uh, we've only got about 45, I'm sorry, 94% of all the um, businesses in Erlanger County for but that's gonna be the range that it would be an impact to us if we would choose to do that. Um, staff recommendation right now is not to, not to proceed with this and not to approve this. That's a pretty big impact to our budget. Um, I, 
What? I would make the assumption that when cities did this, the other cities, it was probably during a time where they raised their occupational license, so it was easier to offset that maybe. Um, so I think that's definitely something we need to look at if we ever do that in the future, and even you know something we could consider in the future. Matt, the, what, what I didn't see here, um, I, I mean, I see the 450 to 550 is reduced revenues, but that's just on existing payrolls. Correct. So what would the 2018 the, payrolls? So, right. so what would the net be if we're if they're going to bring you know a thousand jobs that are they're bringing their their payroll for the year for taxes for us would be 125,000. Okay, is what they're estimating right now. Yeah, we, we looked at that to see if it would offset, um, but you know, obviously it's not. Um, but you know, so the staff looked at it. We we thought that you know the half a million dollar decrease right now would would not be a good idea. Um, Erlanger has lower taxes over the past five years, and we just lowered the insurance premium tax, so we are reducing a lot of the other taxes. Um, Matt, we haven't we haven't reduced the insurance premium tax. We voted to it. It'll take effect. Uh, July 1st. Right? We haven't passed any legislation. I thought we voted on that and it would take effect. Okay. No, there's been no legislation. Oh, it's been, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so, you, we have lowered tax over the last five years. Um, we do have strong incentive packages um, already, so that was another reason that um, we decided that we would recommend waiting on it. Um, but we do want to keep it in mind for, for the future. So any comments, anybody have any questions on that? If there's anybody that wants us to continue looking at that, we will. Not when it's that high. Sorry? Not when it's that high. Okay. All right, moving right along. The next thing is I did send out, um, I believe it was last week, our foreclosure uh, summary for what the staff did to, to analyze the four properties we're looking to foreclose on. And if anybody had any specifics on those, if we wanted to discuss that at all. Um, two of them we recommended to um, proceed to foreclose, two of them we did not at this time. We're gonna do a uh, wait and see if those are able to resolve themselves, um, but if, if nobody has any questions, go ahead. Yes, Vicki. Um, I have a question about the one on perimeter. I believe the staff recommendation was to, to um, put in criminal charges. Yes. Um, how does that work with the problems that they have? Because I didn't understand where the criminal offense came in. So any time that we write a codes violation, it's, it can be a criminal offense. So. Well, we're gonna, we usually don't proceed that direction. We usually just file liens and things like that. Uh, but the option is always to file them criminally. So what our goal is, is to try to exhaust all of our other options before we go to foreclosure. Because on that particular property, the owners actually live there. So it, it's a little more challenging than the normal foreclosures we go on to, but we all know the extreme situation there that we've been dealing with for so long. Um, so I discussed it with Jack, and that was his recommendation. Let's try that uh, one more spot. Yeah, so I, so I think the idea is, is the district criminal court would be better suited to deal with the issues that are really at play there and probably could get them in, in uh, mental health court and help kind of supervise them. It's not necessarily to put them in jail or to fine them. It's just that I think um, with some of the issues at play at that property, um, they need um, some active engagement with the court, and, I th and and we think that at least at this stage, that's maybe the well, yeah, the, the, the most the most humane way to deal with it. Yeah, and when I yeah, that's a good point. When I say criminal, we're not we're not going to be looking to arrest them. We're going it'll be a criminal summons to court just to show up to court. So it's not like we're going over to arrest them. So that's a good clarification. Right. I think when I look at these, I mean, there's not really an action that council needs to take, right? I mean, we've already given you the tools to do what you think is appropriate on these properties. Um, yeah, that's all I was getting ready to say. So my, what I'm going to do is, as long as everybody's in agreement, I'm just going to ask Jack to start the foreclosure proceedings on the two properties that uh, we, the staff recommended to start. And then the other two we'll evaluate over the next six months, and then I'll bring those to your attention. Um, but, but I do want 
I just I do want council to be aware because it's a you know foreclosure on properties is it's kind of a bigger thing. I just want everybody to to understand what we're doing and, and isn't, why. Isn't there some kids involved in one of the houses that the kids are not supposed to be in? Um, one of them has had social services know, intervene but, uh, and they're not allowed to have. But uh, their kids are still there. We've, so. we've been monitoring I them. know. Yeah. So have I. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about the kids. Right. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the foreclosures or comments? The next one is the street name change. I'm going to go ahead and push that off. We've uh, this week we've had some. Uh, this has to do with a business that is um, going to be relocating in Erlanger, and we're going to we're going to hold off until we get some things finalized on that. Um, if that's okay with everybody, um, the next thing would be the annexation on Turkey Foot. I briefly discussed this at the council meeting, and um, Council Member Meyer wanted to discuss it a little bit more. So I sent this out to everybody. I don't know if it was this week or last week. I'm starting to lose track, which you guys probably are too. I apologize for all the emails, but I wanted to give everybody information before the meeting so they're not surprised by it. Um, this is the location on Turkey Foot that is unincorporated Kenton County um, from what everybody from what the staff thinks this is the last piece of unincorporated property that's surrounded by Erlanger property so this would be the last one it's about a little over 10 acres um, Drees is the applicant they're wanting to put 19 homes on it um, right now they're they're estimating those will be three hundred and fifty thousand dollar average cost um, and it will be one street Um, we did a 45-year financial analysis, and uh, the revenues, we, we took the three, the reason it's 310, even though they're estimating 350, is um, council, yeah, council member records mentioned to me that it's most of the people who live there are going to probably be on Homestead um, because of the their target customers. So I did, went ahead and re reduced it for that um, by our current tax rate. And I based it on 37 actual years of the 45. They, they are talking right now it's going to be a seven-year build-out. So just to add, be a little more conservative, that we're not going to get taxes till you know the eighth year. So I'm not counting seven years out of there. Um, but right now, for the 45-year analysis, it would be about 450000 is what we would see in tax revenue. And then the costs uh, had Public Works um, conduct a, a maintenance and improvements for the street there analysis for 45 years so you can see the 10 year 20 year 30 year and then the 45 year full replacement um, councilmember Meyer asked about the 45 year replacement because that is much longer than um, what we've done in the past and Kenton County did change their ordinance to make the developers build better quality uh, streets so yeah, that's so. why that's why the years are a little a little bit higher um, for that so just looking at our estimates here, and again, I, I believe the tax revenue is very conservative because I used the 350,000, um, the last area that Drees did right next to this. Um, their estimate of what the house values were averaged over 100,000 more than they were expecting. So it, it probably will be higher in that regard. So the uh, total revenue is what we're estimating over the 45 year analysis is, uh, about half a million dollars in the in the black. So staff recommendation, we do recommend to approve the annexation of this property. And I'm Matt, I, just wanted, for any questions. I just wanted to say thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a I like making database decisions. I'm a data guy. So. It's a it's, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think it's a it was a great exercise for us to really put it all down. So yeah, I don't have any issues with that at all. Good. Any yes, sir. Did Mr. Biax help with the costs of the replacement? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, he gave uh, Public Good. Works the Good. a lot of the information. Any questions about that? Any reason not to move forward? Okay, we I will be recommending the first reading here this evening. 
And next on the list will be primary election from Councilmember Meyer. Yeah, this is one I didn't know um, there, that, I, that I've thought about for a while. I know we've got uh, obviously some changes coming um, effect of this election cycle as well, um, starting in November. So um, pulling that you know primary election or that end of filing date back. Um, so uh, for this year, it'll be begin or basically the beginning of January. I think January the 10th is the last day to file for um, running in 2020. Um, and you know. I, I, I've never really under, you know, understood why there was you know, a primary election um, with our current slate of you know, uh, 12 council members. If we, had, we, if we got to 25, we would have a primary election and that would only reduce it to 24. Um, you know, I like the idea of being kind of in sync with some of the other cities in Kenton County um, because you do start to see that press you know, um, over the summer months. Hey, last day to file you know, for election if you're interested in running, you know, those kind of things. So um, you just see, you know, Feels like it would be nice to be kind of in sync with you know what you know what the other cities are doing in Kenton County. You know, there's only a few left that uh, that actually have uh, primaries um, or like being one of those. So, uh, Pat, I know you said you had you know you were looking for some more information. I don't know if you know if we need to kind of talk about you know what kind of questions and things that we can you know um, I'm happy to go do some additional research and and you know help you know answer questions. But um, just kind of want to see what people's thoughts were about. Eliminating our primary. Would it be different for city council versus the mayor position for primary, or would one getting rid of the primary be effective for all elected officials? I mean, I, as I think about it, I you know. I can answer that. It would if we eliminate the primary, we would eliminate it entirely for the city, no matter what um, nonpartisan race. Can you repeat that? Do we know when the filing date for the general election yeah, is? Yeah, I, I, I wasn't looking at that. that okay. one. I, know it's I was just in, curious, yeah. yeah. I'm sure I'll it's... see if I can pull it up real quick. Okay. In progress. <laughs> so basically, if we, if we did this, you could have 30 people run for council you could have five people run for mayor. Good. Okay. Do we think that's likely? No. <laughs> well, you know, I just, <laughs> I know, never say never, but. <laughs> what do, so other than having a later filing date, Mr. Meyer, are there other advantages you see? Not, not other than uh, you know us being you know kind of in sync with you know, what other cities are doing. Um, you've got you know additional opportunity for other people to you know to get involved and, and engaged, and you know and, I, I, and and maybe there are other other things that I'm not thinking about, but um, it's just one of those things that I thought was. Kind of odd over the the you know the years that I've been paying attention. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's any harm in keeping it. Um, I mean, we saw on the ballot in in 16 that there were 24 candidates running, um, and it could be 30, and then we wouldn't see that until the general and our our residents wouldn't. We have such poor turnout, unfortunately, in Kenton County. Um, you know, when people do show up to the polls and there's 24 people running, it's, it can be overwhelming. Um, so I think that the existence of a primary or the option for a primary, which can always be voted on and, and voted, you know, to change and not, I mean, if we were to eliminate it, we could always bring it back. It, that's always an option. Um, but it at least structures it to where we won't have more than two times the amount of people on council or two times the amount of mayors, ah, uh, mayor, but you know what I mean. I don't know. So it, it keeps it more, I think, more contained, but we could have 30 people run. We just don't know. Um, just real quick, Corinne, your, um, the, the date for 2020 would be June the 2nd, the first Tuesday after the first Monday. Yeah, 
yeah, the first Monday is June 1st, so that's the earliest that <laughs> the filing date would be. Yeah, so it, it extends that, you know, another five months, essentially. <laughs> well, this is true. <laughs> Anybody have any other thoughts about it? I know. Do we need to do a, a straw poll or just kind of leave it leave it as is? Yeah. I have one comment. Um, this is kind of humorous, but years ago when I went down there, I asked the, the clerk, I said, which box do I check? You know, because they have all those different boxes you have to check. and. The girl didn't know what she's talking about. She told me to check this box, and I did, and I got in trouble because you have to make sure the primary and general and all that stuff is. And I, I, I cried because they came after me and wanted to find me. And I told the girl. I even had Bill Ayler write me a letter. But you got to be careful what you, you know, when you go down there. Make sure you check the right box. That's the only thing that scared me. But other than that, I mean, I don't. It doesn't really matter to me whether we have it or not. I see it both ways. Yeah, I'm on the same way. Should I bring it up again? Anything else? All right, the final um, discussion is the citizen assistance program that the staff's been working on. Yeah, Matt, I, before you run through this presentation, I was going to ask if um, we just hold this off for the Blight Task Force we've been talking about. A piece exactly like this, um, so I think there might be some. But we were looking at a, a program that's going to be, I think, a little bit bigger than, than you know, a little of the information that you shared back with me. Um, okay. I mean, we can run through it still anyway, but I'd still like to defer this to the Blight Task Force because this is one of the things that we knew that you know I think some of the properties that we were talking with that are hitting foreclosure we re we've already reviewed in the Blight Task Force, um, so we were aware, aware of those pieces. Okay. Um, I would just like to. Make sure that we're getting, you know, as robust a program as we think we might need. The only issue that I take with pausing this and not walking us through this right now is that there's a there's a situation that needs to be. I mean, there, there's a situation that this was designed based off of. So if we wait, right? But we also have um, there's already things in place that allow the city to remedy situations right without. Um, yeah. Additional legislation. I mean, I thought that was one of the two options. If you've got, you know, things that are in violation, obviously you can continue to cite them, but you could also just go, you know, take care of things and, and put liens on. Right. Uh, that was one of the things that we talked about in in the task force. Um, so those things are still there for the city to be able to, to do if if that needs to happen. Yeah, we can continue to find. Well, no, not even continue to find, right. but you could also remedy as well. Um, as I understand our current ordinances, that allows you to remedy situations um, rather than just continue to fine. So as long as it fits within the current budget, there's really no action to deal with this one property. Okay. I'm not there, aware of that. No, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you know, if there's if it's you know a code violation, then I would say yeah. I don't, I don't know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll defer you know, to, to Jack and others, but I thought the, the remedies were already there to allow you to handle this one property and not necessarily push down a path to say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna try to fix, figure out a solution for this one property and then come back and figure out a solution for no, this, know, no, this, this, this was just based off of yeah. one property, but it, it's a program that can be used for multiple issues that we've had over the years is, is why we brought it up. Vicki, I think you had. I like the idea, and I know I, I think we had discussed it at the Blight Committee because um, I, I, for one, said something about I remember a case, um, your street, Patty. There was an elderly gentleman, and his house was in disrepair. We ended up getting a bunch of volunteers. Once we found out the man needed help, and that's what I was telling them, I said, we need somehow to figure out how to help these people, and that was one of the things that came up, the social worker. So I, that might be what um, he's talking about. Um, but I mean, I, I don't have any problem with it either way. Um, but I know, I know that's our aim. That was our, one of our things that we came up with. So does it really matter if they go ahead with it 
and no, we can just as we find properties out of the blight task force, um, you know, we can continue to ignore those things. Um, <coughs> you know, but it, it, as we're there's there's going to be less for us to really focus on, I think, out of the blight task force as we see, you know, some of those things that would really fit in that niche. Mm -hmm. Just so we don't overwork the social worker, because there's probably a big need for that, I would say, in the city. Well, I mean, the, well, but the, yeah, the I think program is another tool for the social worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and there are a number of with her okay. things in, in, you know, in the area. There's people working cooperatively. Um, there's St. Vincent de Paul now has a microloan program specifically geared towards this. Uh, the Butler Foundation does grants specifically for these these type of events. So, you know, there are programs out there, you know, in the nonprofit sector that address these situations. Um, we just need to make sure that we're, they're getting connected with those those people. And sometimes it involves them physically applying to these other social service agencies. Um, but whether or not we need city funds, you know, you know, appropriated to do that, I don't know that, you know, we, I mean, we certainly can and we've got the ability to do that today without appropriating additional funds. I thought that's what Becky did. I thought she would put them in touch with the correct um, services right yeah this program would would be when she's exhausted all other avenues um when when we've tried everything that we can because some of these some of the people can't make their own application they either have mental illness that prevents them from from doing it and there, there's other things so this is just this would just be a tool for the social worker to use when she's exhausted all other saint vincent de paul church organizations everything else this would just be a kind of a last resort that would that would help. Tyson, did you have something? Well, yeah. I was going to ask Mr. Meyer how quickly you think that something would be finalized with the Blight Task Force that, uh, I mean, how long are we going to put this off? Um, so we were originally going to look at another set of properties tonight and then and use that. So once we get through our next piece of assessment, then we felt that we would have enough base of review of the entire city. Um, where we could start to make some recommendations to the rest of council mm -hmm. on what we wanted to do with that. Um, so mm -hmm. I, so I don't think we're, we're not talking about you know another six months or anything like that. And um, we, you know, we're planning you know before you know early fall that you know we'd be moving forward with specific actions to address things that we were seeing related to blight. And this, you know, this program would be one of those those type of things. But we also wanted to understand you know what do we feel like you know that is? Are we talking about one property, or are we talking about ten? Um, and if it's one, I, I don't necessarily know that, you know, we make legislative changes for a single piece of property. Right. Right. Uh, I agree. I mean, there, there's a, there's enough of a collective presence here and connections to other agencies where, you know, as long as we're aware of them, we can start to make those personal connections and, and make people aware of things that are available. Okay. I mean, it, I'm not on the task for the, the blight task force, so I don't know what, what you've been discussing, but, and I also. I'm not familiar with this presentation, so I don't know what this is going to be either. So hearing you guys talk about it, I'm kind of in the dark, you know, knowing what one would do or one the other wouldn't do. Um, yeah, well, one of the you know one of the things that where we really discussed it was you know where we start to levy you know certain amount of fines, right? And the cost of remediation would have been less than the fines that we were levying. You know, that's one of the, those areas that we think it's you know it absolutely makes sense, right? I mean, why give a thousand dollar fine if it costs five hundred dollars to remediate? Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll remediate, you know, because we have the ability to do that today, and then we'll put the lien on the property and we'll call it a day. Okay. I mean, me personally, I it, I hope it doesn't offend you, Mr. Meyer, but I I would still like to see the presentation. No, that's fine. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and go through it real quick here. Um, just so everybody's kind of aware of how this started. Um, when we started doing, um, codes officers actually uh, approached me and wanted to discuss with the staff two uh, specific properties that were they were having a lot of issues with that they were trying to uh, to fix. So we, we had a meeting with a social worker and, and some other state um, reps to see what we could do. Um, and then once we went over the foreclosure process, the staff started talking a, a lot. You know, a lot of these issues that were, that were coming to foreclosure um, were things that we probably could have fixed five years ago, which wouldn't have had so many fines and have uh, a lot of these issues. So um, 
so if we were being proactive, we really would be able to limit the, the, the financial uh, exposure to some of the situations because just for foreclosing on, we're talking $3,000 in most cases. So uh, like um, Councilmember Meyer said, you know, the $500 fix for a $1,000 fine, it, it's a better way to do it. Um, so this, this would be a tool for the, the police social worker. I don't think it would be something that would be used very often, but on those instances where they do, it gives her another tool when all the other um, services have been exhausted when she hasn't been able to get help for anything else. Um, how it would, would work is step one would be an employee of the city or elected official would report um, any kind of issue with a citizen or property that might need assistance. This is the same thing that's happening today when PD goes to a house, when fire goes to a house, um, when elected officials or public works sees um, a property or a resident that could need some assistance, they'll go to the public or the police social worker. Um, so at that time, you know, just like uh, Becky does, she, she takes a look into the situation and see what can happen. Um, if during that investigation she realizes this might be a, a, a method that, or a, a tool that she might be able to use, there's three basic guidelines that she's going to look at before she even approaches me or the staff um, to look at this in the future. One of is, does the pro is the property in a negative, does the property have a negative effect on the citizen's health? Um, so some of the properties we've been looking at, you know, they have holes in the roof, holes in the ceiling, they have mold, other issues that are causing health, health problems with the, the citizens. Um, also, does the property have negative effect on a neighborhood? You know, we have other residences that are blighted. And what that's doing is, is bringing down, um, you know, the neighborhood around them. Um, the third one is, is, does the citizen have the opportunity to help themselves financially or mentally? You know, some people, if they're just being defiant and don't want to do it, that's not part of the program. You know, that's something that we're going to have to utilize the, the fines and codes, um, liens and everything else that we would do. So if those three things, it looks like one, of the, one or two or more of those are uh, fall in line here, then she's going to continue like she normally would in attempting to use churches, nonprofits, and, and other avenues first, um, which once in a while she does get into a situation where that can't um, fix the problem. And we have two properties like that. Um, one is the one that we're actually trying to work uh, with this to see if it'll work out, and the other one, it, the person had, does have mental uh, mental illness that's just not not being able to be uh, rectified with this. So, if the uh, social worker has exhausted all other options, the staff will determine um, if the citizen of the property meets the criteria. And we, we would use same three criteria. And, you know, does can the citizen help themselves, or does the city really need to step in? You know, are they having mental illness? Do they have financial issues? Or are they have physical limitations that prevents them from doing what they need to do to get the property. Sorry, I'm working off two screens here. Um, so, you know, they're looking to see if, if we really do need to help out or if it's something that they're either just not doing. Um, if they do need our help, then, then we'll look into it more. Um, will the assistance maintain or increase property values in the area? And we have a couple examples of, of what that would do to help keep the uh, property values high in the area if we would assist them. Um, would the assistance help the house come into a healthy condition for current residents or even future residents? Because that's the, the property we're looking at right now, that's the big key, is five years ago there was a hole in the roof that we were aware of and it never got repaired, so now there's a, a pretty bad mold problem and the, the residents that live there are having more health, re, health issues because of that is what the family is explaining to us. Um, will the assistance help um, limit future expenses. So will, will it help limit us to foreclose? Will it help limit codes having to be out there regularly? Help limit us having to file more liens, which all cost money and time. Uh, with it, we also want to make sure that the resident will be able to sustain the property after we uh, mitigate it. So if there are things that we do for the property, we, we don't want it to be come back into disarray or in the poor condition. They have to be able to maintain it or we probably shouldn't be um, putting any money towards it. Um, the, the other part of it is this is not going to be something we're giving them money. It is going to be um, money that's going to be recouped. So we're going to up, up front some of the costs, but we're also going to, to use liens against the property and agreed upon lien with, with the homeowner um, to recoup that in addition to have a promissory note for them to be able to pay it back 
um, within a, a set time, and that's obviously going to be a little bit different between the situations that we might um, might come into. Um, after that, after the staff evaluates all that and they think that it, it is a good program to uh, use for that property or that residence, um, then we'll recommend approval for the mayor if we do uh, move forward with this. So just kind of goals for improvements, we're going to, there's a little bit more that we'll be looking into this and we'll be using the house that we're uh, currently dealing with as kind of a help us narrow down some of the other stuff, but some pairs that we're expecting to use for would be roof repairs, electrical plumbing issues, internal mold um, issues, and any issue that doesn't meet, doesn't allow the property to meet the uh, building code. So, you know, holes in drywall for the ceiling into the attic space, you've got to have that sealed. Um, what it won't cover is home cleanings, um, cosmetic issues, you know, carpet, uh, flooring, paint, or any you know appliances, garbage disposal, refrigerators, stuff like that is is what we're not really gearing towards. Um, so the reason you know, the staff has looked at this and we we like this is it uh, it will assist us in uh, maintaining or increasing the property values in the area for the for the properties that do meet this criteria. Um, it'll save money in the long term for the city, so we don't have to constantly be out at the property, constantly um, you know looking at foreclosure on certain properties. Um, it would improve the living quality of the citizens that are unable to help themselves. So there are some health issues that um, inside the house that this would be able to address. It would limit clo the clerk's time and the code's time in issuing citations and putting liens on properties. And uh, you know what we're hoping is it'll solve problems before they become major issues like some of the houses that we're dealing with now. Um, so that's just kind of like just the summary. I'm open to any questions. Again, this is something we've really only developed over the last 30, 60 days, Good. and we're still uh, looking ahead, into it. Is this modeled after like another municipality's plan? No. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the use of promissory note and how with fair lending, <laughs> yeah. you, this is you this could be pulled questions. off. <laughs> um, yeah, I checked. That was an idea a few, a few months ago on another completely separate situation that I asked uh, Jack to look at and he's why would fair lending come into play because in theory we can um, find the people or put liens on their properties and then enter into payment arrangements with them if people on a fixed income they may have no legal obligation to pay us back I don't know I don't know if that would be a defense with a promissory note between the city and an individual. I know that's why I'm at, I'm just I would yeah, want to so see this it. program. I would want like a, that's why I was asking if it was modeled after something that's been successful because I think it's yeah. it's intriguing. Yeah, I mean, but I, I would guess, want I would want to see a more concrete. I mean, cities breakdown of that all across the Commonwealth will enter into promissory note concepts for delinquent taxes, for liens. I mean, that's pretty typical. So I think it's a similar type concept, like instead of going through the nuisance ordinance and citing somebody, you're kind of ahead of the game saying, hey, you know, we'll do this and you sign this note. Are we going to have collection issues in the note? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't think there would be any, um, I mean, it's just, it's a promissory note between the city and an individual. It's no different than if if you lent me forty dollars and we put it on the back of this paper, I mean that's a binding well, contract. I, I was just right, but that doesn't absolve like, us from any of the collection requirements either. Yeah, right? like down yeah, but, collectability, but, things. Like that. I'm just curious as to like, at the end of the day, wait, from that, I would want to see like a more, like concrete picture as to the, how the entire process would work. But I, I mean, this is, this is so what we would intriguing. What the staff and I talked about is. If we would look at a property that this would fit, we would want a reasonable expectation that we're going to get paid back. Okay, so let's say it's a it's a five thousand dollar cleanup or, or whatever it is, there will be a lien against the property that's agreeable with the owner. I mean, if they're not agreeing to this, then we're not going to we're not going to do it. So if they would agree um, to put a lien against the house and they would make monthly payments, and, it's, it's, and when that is all paid up, then the lien would come off. So that's that's what other program would work. That's what we've talked with this one this one owner, which they've agreed to. 
um, yeah. doing that. It, I mean, it feels strange to me that, you know, we're also going to talk about a reasonable expectation for them to pay it back that we're now getting into the, the underwriting of, of, of said loans. Yeah, but we, I mean, it's just a I, we, we do we, it anyway. We do promissory yeah. notes all the time. Yeah, I mean, and no offense, but your solution is we just fix the problem and then we lean it where we have virtually no chance to collect. At least this gives us some reasonable chance to maybe collect, right? Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying it's a good program or a bad program, but we're already in the position that we have a lot of liens on properties that we sure. may or may not ever collect on. Well, we'll collect them on at some point, right? Maybe. <laughs> no, they're only good for 10 years. Maybe. Yeah. My questions are more because I think this is, I'm a rookie, if you will, for counsel, and I think it's really neat that there's even a promissory note agreement with, with a municipality. I'd like to learn more about it. It's not necessarily even specific to you know, current residents that we have these agreements with, if you will. So it's more of a, I'm intrigued by this, and then I, w I would be curious to see like the entire, more detail as to these agreements with the city and how they're, how they're made. Yeah, I, I just had, you know, one question. Is this, I know we're talking about, you know, this is based off, you know, one house that has some issues. Is this the same house that has, was an issue, you know, a year and a half to two years ago? No. Okay. I, I know that there was one that was out there, um, and I know sometimes you, you can't, there are things that some of the other social service agencies need people to do, and, and there's money out there, but you can't force them, you can't right. have them fill out, you know, paperwork. You can't force them to do those things and make phone calls. Right. Tyson. Yeah, I mean, I, I shared the, some of the same uh, questions and concerns about the, uh, you know, get, getting paid back and things like that, as um, Mrs. Reckers has, has expressed. Uh, the one thing that I, I saw on there, um, and it's a small item, so I think it'd be a, a small issue to correct if we were to go forward with it. One of the items you had said was any building code issues. Um, that's, that's kind of a Pandora's box. Uh, I know my house was built in 1991, and it doesn't meet the current building code. You know, codes change over time, the uplift oh. calculations and snow load calculations and all kinds of crazy things like that. That's a really I, I think that's a verbiage spectrum. thing yeah. I, I added yeah. in there. What it, my, my point is, is even with talking to this resident, you know, this is not gonna be a take a picture now, take a picture later, it's gonna be a redo, it's not. This mm -hmm. is taking mm -hmm. care of what needs to be done. You know, we're not painting walls, we're not replacing carpeting, mm -hmm. you know, they can live on subfloor. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but for us to put money towards it to fix them, we really want to get them into a healthy state, you know, yeah. uh, and how they can live safely in the residence. Right. So that's, that's where we want to focus any monies that we put up front is on things that are necessities, not, not would be nice to have. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's kind of where we're focusing on. Okay. The property we have, the owner allowed us to do an inspection after, you know, a long time of them not wanting to deal with us at all. So we finally explained to them our idea, nothing that's been approved yet, but we, we went in and we found, you know, they just replaced the, the, the roof, which solved a lot of the, the issues. But the point is, is five years ago, we knew about the leak. It probably would have been a much smaller patch job and now it needed a full roof. Um, you know, they, they do have some holes in the ceiling where the leaks have came in that'll need to be replaced. Even the drywall, we're pretty confident that we'll be able to get help from the churches and stuff for that. What we can't get help is the electrical, the plumbing, um, which uh, Becky has already contacted a, a plumber and an electrician that are willing to do it for free because they heard, you know, she explained the program that we're wanting to do it to help the citizens. Um, and, and then with the mold issue on the residents from it leaking for so long, um, that's that's the next step. We're pretty sure we can. Um, we've got confirmation that they're come out and do it, the inspection for free for the mold, which is still a big deal. Sure. Um, but that's you know Becky's working with that. Um, and then and yeah, the other one was drywall. I think that's something that we'll be able to fix. So we're trying to use the resources that she has and the stuff that is a little harder to get. This is a way to get the residents up to a, a healthy state quicker okay so you know we, we we have looked at a few grants and a lot of them you you kind of have to know what you're looking for ahead of time and then that takes a long time 
you know, but living in mold for as long as they have already, you know, we're, we're just trying to look for other options to give the social worker an extra tool to take care of some critical issues that are happening right now. Wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Nyson. Aren't you referring to reverse mortgage? I am not. No, it's just a... You can go to bank and get a reverse mortgage. Yes, you can. And pay it back when you want to. If you die, they've got where your property. Correct. No, the people that some of the people that we're dealing with don't have great credit. They don't have as many options, or they wouldn't be in the situation that they're in. And that's what we're trying to assist with. But if they come along and don't want this, you're going to condemn the house and make a move. We we might yeah condemning would be an option. And that's what we're trying to prevent because, again, it's, it, we don't like to kick people out of their houses. And if it's something that we can, as a city, can help up front with the understanding that it's going to be paid back, then I think it's, you know, the staff thinks it's a, it's a good move for, for us to be able to help and fix the problem now. If they don't pay you back in 10 years, you foreclose on them. They're, right. There's other options, right? You can do small claims or other other options that they don't get paid back. Okay. That's always a risk that when we're doing this. This is not a guaranteed to get paid back. <coughs> yes, ma'am? Is there a particular budget intended for this program, or is it uh, just based off of? Yeah, that's if we want to move forward with it for an ordinance, I, we would like to uh, add a budget line under the police social worker that would fund things like this. Again, I don't think it's something that we're going to use often. You know, maybe in the beginning there might be a catch-up where we, we identify some houses that have been going on uh, for a long time that might be able to help. But I think long-term, you know, this is going to be a rare instance when all of our other resources are exhausted. Yeah, Matt, you said to add a budget line on it, but we only approve those those high-level buckets. I mean, that's all. The, that's the only level that we appropriate at. Are we saying we want to? do a budget amendment to increase one of those by $10,000 or whatever? I don't or do think we that's think you've got room within the budget? I think we're going to be able to do it within this year's budget, but for next year, we would like to add a line item specifically just for that. Um, it's, again, this is going to, yeah. we're doing a little bit of research here to see how much this. And you're saying line item, you're saying a separate appropriated item specifically for this program? Yes. So we'd have, you know, the, you know, police, fire, general administration, and then it would be, it would social be, program? It would be under police department. Okay, so not necessarily a separate appropriation, but just an additional line item. Correct. Because we don't necessarily vote on those additional line items. We're just approving that entire bucket. Correct. So if you did, if you put in a new line item this year, it wouldn't really matter as long as that total, that top dollar amount changes. Okay. Any questions about the program? Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and move forward with just getting that initial um, information. I think once we get some prices back on that property, it'll give us a good idea moving forward on what kind of budget uh, we're going to need. And then, you know, before we, we go to that next level, we'll, we'll see if we can need to make this into an ordinance. And, and, and I'll look into what, Gary, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but you're saying, I mean, I, we're going to move forward with the ordinance despite or in spite of whatever the budget requirement is right because you're saying we think we believe we can handle the situation and under the current budget but the program to allow us to spend the money on those things would be completely separate from that budgeted line item i'm gonna have a better answer for that in two weeks okay i, mean, I, I think we need to do a little bit more research on this property just to see what kind of budget we're talking okay so you're thinking we potentially might need more than what could be accommodated under the current police budget okay. correct potentially Any other questions? All right, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, that's the last item on the committee meeting agenda. So we'll go ahead and close that. And I will call the special council meeting for August 20th um, to order. Um, Nayoka, if you could take roll call, please. Mr. Burke. Here. Mr. Cahill. Present. Ms. Kyle. Here. Mr. Skidmore. Here. Ms. Setkamp. Here. Ms. Cahill. Here. 
Mr. Meyer? Present. Ms. Skidmore? Here. Ms. Pitts? Here. Mr. Nicely? Here. Ms. Reckers? Here. Mr. Hermes? Here. All right. We'll move on to legislation. We have two pieces. I'll hand it over to our city attorney, Jack Gatlin. Sorry. First, we have an ordinance of the city of Erlanger to change the number of city council members from 12 members to eight members. By summary, the ordinance is very simple. If you see, uh, we have struck through section 1.0, which strikes out 12 members, and it would change it to eight members, and that would be um, effective at the, uh, during the November 2020 local elections. This is a second reading, and therefore would require a first and second. Is there a motion? Mr. Hermes, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Mr. Meyer, and we need a roll call vote. Uh, before we or, do that, can we have some discussion okay. just about this real quick? Sure. Um, you know, I, I, well, I, I know, I just, I, the, there was one thing, I, I don't necessarily, you know, support us going to the eight right now. I mean, I know I've talked to in the past about us moving to 12, but um, I, I would move to amend the eight or amend the ordinance as written from eight to ten um, and look at a more slower approach to you know attempting to do that result might be the same but I think it's it's much different than um, you know scaling back that quickly um, so that that's my my motion to amend okay so we have a motion on the floor do we have a second Um, do we need discussion on the amendment from eight to 10? Well, so I think, I think practically what we've just done is we have a first and second motion to amend the uh, ordinance that we already had a first and second on, which I'm fine with. So I think we would need to either have, and I think I'm just talking over you and I apologize. I'm just clearing this up in my own head as we're going through this. I think we need to have discussion on the amendment, vote on the Correct. amendment, and then we would have a rereading if the amendment passed. So I do think we need now discussion on the amendment. Mr. Hermes. So my question would be is if the amendment is successful, does the ordinance have to go back through another first and second reading or would we be voting on the amended ordinance tonight? So the issue there would be is whether it's a substantive change. And um, people aren't going to like my answer to this, but I do think going from 8 to 10 would be a substantive change and would require a new first reading. No, we right. want to read it tonight. Whatever we got to do, we want to read it tonight. We've been going on too long. Well, we have a first and a second. Well, that's so we're in discussion for the amendment. So now we need to do a roll call vote for the amendment correct whether or not that passes and if it doesn't pass then we go back jack why would why would that one become a, a substantive change i know I, that there's been changes to is. budgets that have been where there were some errors in emissions and you know three hundred thousand dollars was determined not to be substance uh, substantive I mean, I, it's, it's my opinion that changing it from 8 to 10 would be substantive because people are on notice tonight thinking it's going to 8, and I think a floor amendment to uh, increase the proposed size by 25% is substantive and therefore would require a new first reading. I think it's the safest approach. Okay. I mean, I understand that going from an, one number doesn't seem like a change, but if you really think about it, you're increasing the proposed change by 25%. I think that's substantive. But you're Mrs. lessening Kyle. the change. Jesus Christ. Ms. Kyle. Six. Well, I think if we wanted to have the change, like from the 8 to the 10, like we're trying to do tonight, that should have come up way before this because this has been on the books. And we should have had the second reading She's last exactly time, right. but we didn't. I would and agree with you, Ms. Kyle. So I really think we're just beating. And, and I horse. think the challenge, the, the only challenge there is we threw it up for a first reading before, you know, there was a, a little discussion and then we threw it off for our first reading before actually having a, 
any additional discussion no, about the No, we had a lot of discussion. Of, no, I know, but additional <laughs> discussion about what those specific things were. So the first time we saw the eight was at the first reading. And at that point, because of the way we, we operate, we didn't have a chance to, you know, make a change at that point. But I Well, I, I just won't vote for the 10 because yeah. of the, the, the way it's been dragged out. I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, it, we should have thought of this sooner. You are correct. Okay. So we have a first and a second on the amended. So we need to do a roll call on that first in order to do this properly, correct? Yeah, on the, on the amendment. Okay. <laughs> so we need a roll call on the amended, and then we'll move on to the next process. You're voting right now on whether you're amending to 10. And if you amend to 10, then we go back to a first reading September 3rd. Yeah, same old song and dance. Mr. Meyer? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Reckers? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hermes? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Skidmore? Ms. Sutkamp? No. Mr. Cahill? No. Ms. Skidmore? No. Ms. Kyle? No. Mr. Burke? No. Mr. Nicely? Yes. Ms. Cahill? No, ma'am. Ms. Pitts? No, ma'am. Amendment fails. So now we're going to do a roll call vote on the ordinance. The change to eight. Do we need to have any additional discussion? <laughs> Jack? That, that's up to you all. No, there's no other discussion needed. All right. Roll call vote. Ms. Reckers? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hermes? Yes. Mr. Skidmore? I want to leave it at 12. Ms. Sudkamp? Mr. Cahill? No, ma'am. Ms. Skidmore? No, ma'am. Ms. Kyle? No, ma'am. Mr. Burke? No, ma'am. Mr. Nicely? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Cahill? No, ma'am. Ms. Pitts? No, ma'am. Mr. Meyer? Yes, ma'am. Okay, ordinance fails. Okay, the next ordinance is a first reading of the annexation. I'm sorry, do you have a question? I, I didn't, I just wanted to say thank you to council for agreeing to de delay that uh, for uh, since the last regular council meeting. Uh, everybody knows that this was my issue, I was not here, and I, I do sincerely appreciate you delaying it until I was here to vote, thank you. All right, next ordinance is an ordinance annexing certain unincorporated territories within the county of Kenton, Kentucky, and contiguous to the present boundary lines of the city of Erlanger, Kentucky, and defining by meets and bounds the territory annexed. Um, you can see attached is the annexation agreement where Drees has agreed to this annexation. It is fully executed. You also can see attached a plat of the 7.826 acres, which is proposed to be annexed. This is just a first reading. Nayoka, if you could note that we had the first reading. And we're at adjournment. Mrs. Kyle, we have a first a motion. And Mrs. Skidmore, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Have a good.